And joining us now, Matthew Mendelson, who is the director of the Mowat Center. Start by reminding us what that is, first of all. Uh, we're a new uh, a public policy research institute, a think tank at the University of Toronto in the School of Public Policy. And our mandate is to look at federal issues, at national issues, but from an Ontario perspective. The one you've got your teeth in lately and that you're here to talk to us about today is representation by population. Yep. Let's start with that. Just, uh, you know, PolySci 101, give us your basic definition of what that is. Well, representation by population has been uh, a foundational principle that people have fought for and died for uh, over the centuries. And in most countries, most democratic countries, it's accepted now as a core principle. And what it basically means is that everyone's vote is equal. Regardless of where you live in the country, you have the same voting power, your vote has the same weight, the same ability to influence who, who is elected and uh, important decisions. So in effect, basically what it means is that there should not be ridings in this country with 150,000 people in them and others with 30,000 people in them, because that's just imbalance. A hundred percent. If you have 30,000 versus 150,000, everyone has a vote, uh, but the people who live in the riding with 30,000 uh, people obviously have much more power and their vote carries much more weight. Uh, we've had this issue uh, over decades uh, in many countries. We even came up with the expression Rottenboro. Rottenboro mm -hmm. was a riding that the population was declining and declining, but they continued to have the same number of uh, seats. And we've worked hard to get rid of those. Here are some ideas that have uh, come from the center, and let's put these up if we can right now. Here's the current seat distribution, followed by if it were rep by pop, what would it be? So we've got 106 seats from Ontario in the federal parliament today. If it were actually representation by population, we'd have more, 117. Province of Quebec, pretty much even. They have 75. They'd lose one by pure rep by pop. BC, they'd be entitled to four more. Alberta, they'd be rep uh, entitled to a couple of more. Prince Edward Island, they are really, by pure rep by pop, overrepresented by a big factor. Why is it that Quebec seems to be the only province that, you know, really comes close to what you're looking for here? Well, what's interesting, and I'd just like to, to um, qualify uh, that a little bit, because we do talk about provinces, but it's important that we're really talking about citizens. Uh, it's not that Ontario is represented. People in Thunder Bay and Kingston and uh, Windsor may have different interests on all kinds of issues. So it's really about Canadians who live in Ontario who are underrepresented and Canadians in Atlantic Canada who are overrepresented. Uh, now, the, the specific question of why Quebec uh, has basically the right number of seats is actually just coincidence. Um, Quebec, based on the formulas that we use, happens to be basically right on the nose. What we have developed in uh, Canada is a series of guarantees, some of which are constitutional, some of which are legislative, that protect the number of seats for slower growing uh, provinces for and example. slower growing. So um, uh, uh, a province can not have fewer number of seats than it has senators. Um, and that really protects the number of seats in uh, the three uh, maritime provinces, but also Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, and uh, provinces cannot have fewer seats than they had in the early 1970s. That, however, is just an ordinary piece of legislation that could be changed any time. But that was a compromise uh, to, again, help protect uh, the seats uh, in Atlantic Canada and in the prairies. Well, now here's where, I mean, this is the grand bargain, right? Back in 1867, there were compromises that were made that did not jibe with Rep. Bipop in order to create this country in the first place. And what you're saying is what? That those compromises no longer make sense today because we all ought to be about Rep. Bipop now? Is that it? Uh, no. Uh, what I would say is that uh, we do have a number of compromises. One, uh, the, the key one was federalism that we created provincial governments, uh, both for Atlantic Canadians and for uh, Quebec. The key ask was that they had local control through provincial governments in exchange for Rep. Bipop. Um, and they were supportive of Rep. Bipop. If you look at the early uh, uh, Confederation debates, Rep. Bipop was broadly and widely accepted. And uh, as you say, we've done all kinds of compromises. Uh, but Rep. Bipop uh, was uh, basically honored in this country until the 1970s. If you look back at deviations from Rep. by Pop in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, everyone accepted Rep. by Pop. It's really only in the 1970s that you start to see uh, these wild deviations. What happened so, then? Uh, well, you started to have quite different uh, population growth in different provinces. So Ontario uh, at first, and then uh, Alberta and British Columbia started to see much higher growth rates in their population. They were attracting immigrants. Uh, Quebec, the other quite large province, their birth rates were declining dramatically at that time, and they weren't ex uh, uh, accepting uh, or receiving as many immigrants. So you had different population patterns. So uh, you began to have 
uh, legislative changes that protected the number of seats, particularly in Atlantic Canada, in Quebec, and in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Now let's consider the effect of all this, because you say in your report that 61% of Canadians are therefore, because we don't have pure rep by pop, underrepresented, visible minority communities in particular. Uh, what's the effect of all that, do you think? Well, uh, I think the effect is that it skews our debate. Uh, it skews uh, the issues uh, that uh, receive attention. Uh, Ontario, British Columbia, uh, they happen to be the most urban uh, provinces. And our research doesn't focus on the urban-rural dimension, but the reality is that the lower mainland and the GTA and other communities, Windsor, London, Kingston, Ottawa, uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario is quite uh, urbanized, as is British Columbia. Uh, so you can easily imagine the skew in debate, whether one is talking about fisheries or agriculture or equalization or public transit, um, where uh, the focus of debate uh, and the issues that are raised uh, are uh, more of concern to people in Atlantic Canada and Quebec. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that they probably have a disproportionate weight in determining not only which issues get discussed, but what the eventual outcomes of those well, issues that, are. That would be the theory. I mean, in theory, what you've said makes sense based on the way the seats are allocated today. In fact, is that the case? Well, uh, uh, there hasn't been any research on that question. Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly, uh, we know that our parliament isn't nearly as diverse as our population. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also know that uh, the ridings that are the largest in terms of population are uh, the suburban ridings uh, around the GTA, around Edmonton, around Vancouver. All of these ridings are uh, incredibly diverse. The most populous ridings in the country, where you have 150,000 uh, people, are Bramley, Brampton, Richmond Hill, and similar kinds of ridings in uh, Vancouver. So the research hasn't been done. You're quite right that it's, uh, it's a theoretical uh, question, but the, the fact remains that people have interests, people defend their interests. Uh, um, if one is debating immigration policy or public transit, uh, people in Bramley have a different interest than someone in, uh, than in rural Saskatchewan, for example, and it's hard to believe that it doesn't have an impact on the debate. Okay, let's check, we went province by province a, a little while ago, let's check now country by country and see how Canada stacks up against some of the others. Again, if we could, this chart here, Michael. If you go, deviation from rep by pop. Canada's at the top of the chart uh, from your studies. There we are, Switzerland much further down, Germany, Australia, and of course the United States, that bastion of representation by population where even to this day they're still having tea parties uh, to confirm what happened 250 years ago. So no one, not even the U.S., has pure rep by pop. Everybody's out a little bit. We're out a lot, apparently, according to your uh, chart here. But are you saying we should strive to be like the American model? Well, I'm saying we have always uh, strived uh, to be uh, uh, like uh, a model of representation by population until the 1970s. This is a recent development, and the United States is, ba is basically a rep by pop uh, country. Uh, you can't get exact rep by pop, uh, otherwise we'd all be in Parliament. There are going to be some small deviations from one seat to another. Um, but uh, we chose uh, democratic industrialized federations um, because they also have issues of minority representation, accommodating linguistic minorities, accommodating diverse uh, regional populations, and they all managed to strike the balance better. And historically, we have struck the balance better. It's only uh, recently that we've put these uh, protections in for uh, uh, slower growing provinces. Why has it been, you said it was the 1970s where this started to become out of step. Well, you know, we're, that's 40 years ago. How come this has not become a bigger issue until now? Well, it's interesting because it has become uh, an issue uh, on a number of occasions. Gordon Campbell, who's Premier of British Columbia, when he was the mayor of Vancouver, he challenged this legislation in court um, in the 1980s. Um, he, he lost his uh, uh, court case uh, in the BC courts and it never went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court chose not to hear it. Um, so these issues have uh, come up. Um, when we had the Charlottetown uh, constitutional discussions back in the early 1990s, then Premier of Ontario Bob Ray um, uh, was focused on the issue of representation by population because our uh, representation had been going down in Ontario. And that was a key uh, cornerstone of the compromise that Ontario had um, and some other provinces to accept Senate reform. Um, so those two were linked together in those discussions. So the issue has come up periodically. Um, there have been uh, uh, um, a variety of court cases on this. 
But over the last decade, I would say Ontario, BC, and Alberta, you're quite right, have been relatively silent on this until two years ago, um, because it, two years ago, um, new legislation was introduced that Ontario was opposed to. And we will follow up on that in just a second. I want to do one more chart here. We've done province by province. We've done country by country. Let's do province by province internationally and see how we stack up here in the province of Ontario. The most extreme deviations from Rep by Pop, according again to the Mowat Centre, Ontario's number one on the list. We are out by the most. And you've got to go to uh, Nordheim Westphalen in Germany, British Columbia is next, Bayern Germany next, and Alberta next. But clearly we're almost twice as badly off as the next one, uh, number two, according to your chart here. Now, because Ontario's provincial ridings almost exactly mirror the federal boundaries as well, does your concern have implications on the provincial scene as well? Well, we didn't do uh, those studies, but uh, um, our, our, our studies looked at um, how uh, Canadians in Ontario, Alberta, BC compared to Canadians in other provinces. But you're quite right, there's significant deviations um, within uh, provinces as well. And those are other uh, constitutional issues and other court cases that could arise. I mean, in Canada, we have uh, decisions that say you can deviate plus or minus 25%. Uh, from the average riding. So that means you do have ridings that are 25% larger and other ridings that are 25% smaller. As you pointed out earlier, in the United States, uh, they don't have that. All congressional districts um, uh, have to be uh, the exact same size or as close as you can get to it. Um, and in other federations, Germany, Australia, Switzerland, they have similar provisions where they're going for uh, equality and they tolerate far fewer deviations. And uh, you're right that we've accepted all kinds of compromises and I think we're trying to have a discussion and debate about whether those compromises may have gone too far away from voter equality. Well, let me push you a little further on this because, again, in the province of Ontario, I think there's a, it's been historically recognized that the North is entitled to a certain floor below which they should not go regardless of what their population is. And they're, you know, what are they now, 107 seats in the legislature, something yeah. like that. And, and the North gets 10 regardless. 11. 11 now? Okay, 11, sorry. If it's pure rep by pop, they're not entitled to 11. Do you want to be the brave premier or minister of intergovernmental affairs or something who tries to go into northern Ontario and say, you know what, you folks are overrepresented and we're actually going to take a couple of seats away from you? I mean, uh, that's not on, is it? Uh, I, I certainly don't. You don't, um, no. Uh, and I think we do have a good uh, tradition of finding ways of... Uh, uh, ensuring the representation of northern uh, regions of remote communities. And I agree of smaller provinces. Uh, our goal is not to uh, overly dilute the representation of Atlantic Canadians or people in Manitoba, but uh, in, in protecting those interests of people in Prince Edward Island or New Brunswick, for example, whose interests are being sacrificed. Uh, and the reality is uh, that the, the interests of new multicultural urban Canada across the country are the ones that are being traded off. And I don't think people would support that when, when the question is, uh, is put that way. And it's probably the case that if one does want to ensure um, uh, that the Northern Ontario has uh, sufficient representation, that you make that case, that you have that discussion, but the fact that a seat in Kitchener or Waterloo might be much larger than one in Windsor, which might be much larger than one in Kingston, there's not really good principle for that. Hmm. Um, and what we're trying to focus on is that, yeah, remote communities, none of it, none of it probably needs a, a seat, even though it only has 30,000 people. Um, Northern Ontario, for a variety of reasons, historical and uh, in terms of the challenges uh, of being heard in Ottawa or Queen's Park, also probably needs uh, extra seats. Um, but those have to be defended, I think, on a principled case-by-case -case basis, and we haven't done that. Well, let's follow up on that. All right, it's always harder to take something away than it is to add, and since Nobody's going to start going to the Maritimes or Northern Ontario and say we're going to take seats away. In their wisdom, the federal government recently proposed the Democratic Representation Act, which is going to give 18 additional seats to Ontario, seven more to BC, five more to Alberta. Now, this hasn't passed yet, but if it did pass, would that fix the problem you're talking about? So this would largely fix the problem. Um, uh, I mean, I know you said 18 seats. Those are all projections. I mean, what, what, the, the pro, what the legislation said, which was just introduced, so it hasn't passed yet, mm -hmm. um, and it's not clear that it will pass. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, what it does is, after the 2011 census, there'll be a new formula 
which is certainly fair and will certainly get us closer to voter equality. And Ontario will probably get something like 17 or 18 new seats, depending on uh, population uh, projections. And uh, those wouldn't come into effect until after 2011, so an election mm -hmm. in 2013 or 2014. Um, and yes, it would come very close to fixing the problem. It would ensure that uh, voters in Quebec, Ontario, BC, and Alberta all have about the same voting power. People in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and uh, the four Atlantic Canadian provinces and the territories, they would still have more power because of a variety of constitutional guarantees. But we'd certainly get closer to fixing the problem, and I think coming closer to finding that compromise that you talked about. However, Matthew, whenever you solve one problem, you do create another. And here's what some critics have said to me about what adding those seats might do. They look south. They see the United States of America, 300 million people, governed at the national level by 535 members of the House of Representatives and 100 senators. And then they look at the House of Commons in Canada, 30 million people, and we're going to add 30 new MPs, which will take us to, what, about 350 or 60 or something like that? 18 million more bucks a year. Half as many MPs to govern a country that's one-tenth the size? Does that make sense? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Thank do you. We have, uh, <laughs> that's why you get paid the big bucks. That's what I do, I hope, uh, yeah. They, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's a different question about whether or not we're over-governed, whether we have too many representatives. Certainly in smaller provinces, when you look at uh, how many MPPs, uh, provincial uh, uh, parliament people in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Manitoba, I mean, they have almost you know, half as many sometimes as, as Ontario. Um, so we do have a lot of elected officials. Um, but uh, you have to bite the bullet somewhere. And either you're taking seats away, uh, which uh, in one of our papers, Andrew Sankton did a paper, and he said that that's exactly what you have to do, that that's what every other federation does. Never happen. That, um, <laughs> It'll never happen. <laughs> that, um, well, it happens everywhere else. Yeah. Um, once it, one, uh, the only time I can remember in Canadian history it happened when Mike Harris was here and he reduced the size of the Ontario legislature. He did, but that was across the board. Yeah, um, That wasn't uh, going into particular provinces and saying you're going to have fewer seats. Right. Um, and so uh, it's certainly plausible that it could happen. Mm -hmm. I, I hear what you're saying, that you don't think it would happen. And here's the um, other problem. But, yeah. The other problem, is ne never mind over-government, over-governing, which some people will say it's a problem. If you add more seats to Ontario, B.C., and Alberta, that means the percentage of Quebec's seats in the House is less. And they'll never go for that either. So again, we have another solution which raises another problem. Would you uh, agree? Um, I, I think that the question of Quebec's representation also is a legitimate issue and a legitimate discussion to have. And there are certainly ways to ensure uh, that, Quebec's, um, that uh, Quebec's proportion of seats never falls below its proportion of population. But I think in reality that if you know, Ontario, BC, Alberta, other provinces have a lot more uh, population growth, New Canadians are moving in there, and they're looking for representation, and they have their own issues and challenges. Uh, at a certain point, if Quebec's population or the pro population of any province, or Ontario's at some point in the future, isn't growing, I mean, we can't predict the future. I mean, it's certainly possible that other provinces will see higher population growth or lower population growth. Saskatchewan now is experiencing population growth mm -hmm. that it hadn't uh, a, a decade ago. But humor so, me on this. Quebec is a distinct society, many would say and therefore ought to be treated differently, many would say, and they've had a constant, I don't know if it's constitutional, they've had a, a historic guarantee in this country to have, what, a quarter of the seats in the House, regardless of what size their population is, and it can't imagine. Well, we remember from Meech Lake, when they went down to 24% or 23%, yeah. you know, all hell broke loose. So that's not on, right? Well, they don't have a constitutional guarantee no, for 25%. It's a traditional guarantee. They're down to 24%. They've been losing seats uh, proportionally, not raw number. They have a guarantee for 75 seats. So the question is, if you guarantee Quebec 75 seats and you guarantee that Atlantic uh, Canadian provinces can't have fewer uh, MPs than they have senators, then the issue is, do you allow uh, um, proportionally uh, seats in Ontario, British Columbia, and Alberta to become larger and larger and larger, um, uh, with those Canadians having less and less voting power, that the voting power of Canadians in Ontario, BC, and Alberta becomes more and more unequal, uh, that the voting power of people in the five eastern provinces becomes greater and greater, or do you bite the bullet and say, we're going to have a few more MPs? And politics is about making difficult choices, and there's never a perfect solution. And at the end of the day, um, from my perspective, having a few more MPs is not the end of the world. Politics is also the art of the possible. And 
my hunch is going into Quebec and saying your population doesn't justify you having the number of seats that you currently have or may have is not on. And the question, I, I guess, okay, final question here then is, you know, you're putting rep by pop forward as a kind of a magic bullet. It, it, is a, uh, it is a principle which you believe is deeply felt and extremely important to the good governance of the country. But so is tradition. And so are the compromises that got this country to where it is today. And so is the floor of seats that some provinces have felt entitled to since time immemorial, or at least 1867. So why is Rep by Pop any more important for the successful governing of this country than any of those other things? I don't think it is. I think what I'm saying, and I think what the studies show, uh, is that we've been uh, getting out of whack on those compromises, that representation by population was important, and the protection of smaller, slower-growing provinces, including Quebec, uh, was important. And over the last 30 years, uh, the pendulum has been swinging continuously in favor of the protection of smaller uh, and slower-growing uh, provinces. And we have to move the pendulum back. So I, I agree with you on the tradition. I agree with you on the compromise. And the proposed legislation doesn't deliver a rep by pop. Uh, it does, though, restore some of the balance and gets us more in line, not only with international practice, but some of our historic traditions where rep by pop was important. It is in the Constitution, but so is the protection of the number of seats for Quebec. Uh, so Quebec doesn't lose seats uh, in this. No, no one in Atlantic Canada uh, loses seats. Uh, no one in Manitoba or Saskatchewan loses seats. Uh, so I do think that this represents a good compromise. And as you say, um, uh, Quebec may not go for this, um, but the federal government's done lots of things that Ontario hasn't gone for or that Manitoba hasn't gone for. At the end of the day, governments have to make uh, choices that may not be particularly popular in some regions, and that's what they do. Um, and BC, Alberta, and Ontario have been lobbying for this, often together, for the last couple of decades. Not necessarily the top issue, but it's certainly been something on the agenda, on the radar that has arisen. And this is a federal government uh, with the support of the, the, the liberals in opposition federally, seem to be supporting it and, and ready to move forward. And good for you guys at the Moat Center for contributing to the discussion as well. Matthew, thanks for coming into TBO today. Thank, thank you for having me.